Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Thank you. Let's not mirror the clouds outside. Did you know that today is the Orthodox Easter? So last week in uh, Western Christianity, we celebrated Easter. Today is uh, Holy um, Pascha for the Eastern Orthodox Church. Today is Easter. So I want to just acknowledge that and um, send them blessings. Um, I know we have people online, and I know we have people from multiple faiths and traditions and cultures that join us in unity. So I want to acknowledge that they have the same uh, experience of resurrection and coming to life and being transformed and and building new life that we get to experience as well. You with me? Good. Do you ever lose anything? (laughs) Oh, never. I, you know, I lost my keys once, and you know where I found them? In the refrigerator. I, I don't know. Don't ask me why. I, I, don't, I have no idea how they want. But clearly, losing my keys, and it's not the only time I've lost my keys, um, I can lose them in my purse. And I'm not somebody that carries a saddlebag for a purse. I carry a purse about this big, and I've lost my keys in a purse. But I lost them in the refrigerator, and so I think what that kind of meant for me was, um, slow down, what are you doing, pay attention, what's going on. Did you ever lose something and like in a movie theater or the airport or the grocery store or the library or just in a public place, and then you realize you've lost it, and what does somebody say to you? Where were you last, and what else? Check the lost and found. How many of you have ever visited a lost and found? There's some interesting stuff there, yeah? I find myself, I've done it before, and there's this like box of things, and you start going through, and I don't know about you, but this sort of mirrors the keys in the refrigerator routine. I'm going through boxes of things, and I totally lose what I'm looking for. Because I'm so fascinated by the stuff that's in there, especially when it's something where you think, okay, so somebody's wandering around life without this. Like, I think I feel nervous, right? They're wandering around without something that seems important to me. Yeah, check the lost and found. There's some very interesting things in the lost and found. But that's where, uh, apart from where was the last place you looked, isn't, and I always find that interesting too, because really the last place I looked, like, or they say, it's always the last place you looked. Well, of course it is, (laughs) because I found it. So that would be the last place I looked, right? That's one of those Captain Obvious things, but someone's wanting to be helpful. So yeah, so that's what I'm actually talking about today is the lost and found, the lost and found. And I think, and it was funny because when I came up with the title, I I didn't even, this shows the, um, you know, uh, kind of points to how I was raised or the difference in, differences in the way we were raised and different faith traditions is I had someone say to me, oh, that reminds me of like, Bible Sunday growing up and lost and found, like being a sinner, right? I'm lost and then I was found. And I thought, wow, that didn't even cross my mind, not even remotely, not even a little bit. Um, And yet, (laughs) I know, right? Yeah, thank God. Um, um, And yet I know for some people it does cross their mind. So I left it alone um, because I'm not going to talk about us being sinners, but I am going to talk about uh, a parable that is often interpreted as, as having to do with sinning and repenting. Um, but I, I want to put it in the context of, um, of Jesus' parable, but, I want, but in the context of, our, of some of our greatest spiritual leaders. And it was, um, I'm sure this was because I had given a title and a, and a description to Aaron, but you had a couple of songs where you mentioned Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Jesus and Buddha, and I'm like, wow, it's like magic. I'm looking at the words and singing along. I'm like, they knew what I was going to say, right? Um, But yeah, they, they, and if you look at each one of those people, there are elements of their teaching and their way of being that's really about being countercultural, right? Upsetting the apple cart, um, just being a rabble rouser, turning things inside out, being revolutionary. And trust me, if you know me at all, I'm all for it. I'm good to go. We want to... Yeah, we want to turn it inside out and upside down and, and shift conventional wisdom 
Because do we not need it more today than like ever before? Yeah. So, um, so I'm all for it. And I think, okay, so I look at Jesus, I look at Buddha, I look at Martin Luther King Jr., I look at, you know, all, anybody that's a spiritual leader, um, and I think, well, I'm in good company um, if, I'm, if that's who I'm with. But what's interesting about it is that they also had teachings that were not countercultural, that were not like revolutionary, that were not, that were really just pointing us to something we already knew. They were just pointing us to something that was already within us and alive within us that were not about being revolutionary and, and turning, you know, conventional consciousness inside out and upside down. There were, there were teachings they had that were um, just directing us back to, to look at yourself. Don't you hate it when you ask someone a question and they respond with a question? Like, just answer my question. Just tell me, what am I supposed to do? And then somebody responds with, yeah, what do you think is the right thing for you to do? I'm like, no, 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 just answer my question. I don't want to think that hard. I don't want to self-reflect anymore. Just tell me what to do, and I'll be really happy. Um, but it doesn't work that way. But there are some teachings that come down through our lineage from multiple sources that are about just redirecting us back to what we already know, maybe a little unsettling, but to what, is, to what we value most. To, to what um, gives us our sense of belonging and what we long for most. So it's, it's a little less about um, being countercultural and being revolutionary and more about drawing our attention to that which we already have, to that which we already know, but yet we have yet to bring it out here and express it. So I want to talk about uh, one parable in particular. Um, it's actually the first one in a series of three, and it comes out of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's, in, it's also in the Gospel of Matthew, but it's um, the lost sheep. Um, and I want to look at it in that context, probably in a different way than you've, than you've heard it before. But it's one parable that is uh, the first of three that all have to do with something that's lost. So there's the lost sheep, and then there's a lost coin, the woman, the woman that has 10 silver coins and loses one. And then there's the prodigal son, which is really a misnomer. Um, it's really a, the lost son. So it's all three parables that are about something that's lost. And what's interesting is um, what's happened to the parables of Jesus over time is uh, they've really become, um, they've come domesticated, would be the word. They've been watered down. And we lose the, really, what was trying to be delivered, the message that was really trying to be communicated, that was really trying to be delivered. And you have to look at, when you, whenever you are looking at scripture, particularly um, uh, when, if you're going to specifically look at the parables of Jesus, because he taught in parables, and he taught in parables on purpose to fry your brain, <laughs> right? That's, that's what he did, and that's why he did it, and it was to, it was to draw your attention to what you're thinking, Sometimes to draw your attention to turn you inside out, and sometimes to draw your attention and intention to what you already know and what's every day and what's commonplace, but you've sort of lost track of, right? Kind of got off the beaten path. And so the lost, I want to start with the lost sheep. Um, and generally, we, how it's heard and how it's been, and when I say domesticated, is that over 2,000 years, it's become... Um, sort of hijacked in a way, and it's become about that this sheep is, I find this really actually quite funny once you start looking at it and reading it, that the lost sheep is this sinner that has wandered away and needs to be found to come back. So in traditional Christianity for centuries, what's happened is the, the lost sheep represents this sinner, this you know, person that's gone astray and needs to be corralled back in needs to repent for their sins to come back into the fold. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think sheep are all that sharp. <laughs> I don't think sheep sin. So the, 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 uh, the story gets a little bit twisted. Um, Jesus spoke in parables, and he used everyday, ordinary terms that first-century Palestine listeners would understand and would know that they could identify with. 
So um, he uses things like a sheep. He uses the coins. He uses, uh, or talents. He uses a vineyard. He uses a mustard seed. He uses all of these things, bread, right, that, that, that a first century Palestine person would know, but he oftentimes uses this, the items, the everyday items, in a very different kind of way. So if you look at, here, so here's what you want to keep in mind. When you're, whenever you're studying parables, whenever you're listening to parables, when you think, if you hear a parable and you think you got it, oh, I get it, the meaning of the story, you didn't. They're not that easy. They're really not. Because what happens, what we have to do is put ourselves back 2,000 years ago, put on what I say, these 2,000-year-old Hebrew eyes, and look at the story in the context in which it was given, it's spoken. So, for instance, the, um, the parable of the lost sheep, I'm just going to do that one, opens, it's in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and it opens with, which person among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, that's just part of the opening sign, sentence, so listen to that for a minute, 2,000 years ago, the people that were listening to Jesus, if you had a hundred sheep, how wealthy were you? Very. So uh, if he were to ask the question of his usual crowd, which one among you having a hundred sheep, he's asking which one of you having a hundred sheep, you know, and losing one of them would go looking. And what do you think the crowd is actually thinking? I have no idea what that would be like. That's, I'm not a wealthy person. I don't own a hundred sheep. I can't even imagine. The same thing is true of the other two parables of the lost, right? The next one is the lost coin. And it opens with, what, a, what a, about imagining this woman who has 10 silver coins and loses one? What do you think the crowd listening to him is thinking? Yes, I wish I had 10 silver coins. What the heck, she lost one? <laughs> Dang. And then there's the story of the lost son, or what we, we have come to be called the prodigal son. And the story opens up that he has, this man has all this wealth, right? And he's going to divide it, it's going to be divided between the sons. And then he's got fatted cows, and he's got the farm, and he's got all this livestock. What picture is being painted? Someone that's wealthy. So how the listeners that were following him around, how much can they identify with these, first of all, where he's starting? Not very many. So already he's, so all of a sudden now we put it in context and we're like, um, yeah. So if you listen with the ears of someone in that context, someone who's just a farmer or just a fisherman, they're like, yeah, I have no idea what it would mean to lose, to have one, to have a hundred sheep. Sweet. Right? So then the next part, you have a hundred sheep. What's the likelihood that you would notice one is missing? Pretty small. Think about a vase of 100 daisies. Would you notice if one was missing? Not likely. Put 100 pennies in a jar. Would you notice if one was missing? Nope. Frankly, I think this parable, instead of the lost sheep, really should have been called initially oblivious owner. Right, because one wanders off. One of them, one of them wanders off. And again, it's the if you read the story the way it's written, it's like all of this energy is put on the sheep as wandering off. The sheep was just being a sheep. Sometimes in a story, a sheep is just a sheep. Sometimes an owner is just an owner. Right? But let's put, start putting the pieces together. Um, so there's one goes missing, and he goes searching for it. Right? And then he finds it, and he puts it on his shoulders, which has got to be extraordinarily uncomfortable, and carries the sheep back to everybody else. And then he has a party. He has a big celebration. And I have to say, as the heretic that I am, I wonder if they served mutton. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. But he carries the sheep back, and he has a celebration not just with family, but with friends and everybody, and like brings everybody in to celebrate that which was found. Jesus' parables oftentimes end with a celebration, with food, 
right? Patricia was talking about everything we do has food. Yay! <laughs> and where does Jesus have these celebrations? Not at an altar, at a table. At a table where everyone is welcome. At a table that you come together and you celebrate that which was lost but now is found. So what does that have to do today? That's the beauty of the parables, is we have to put them in the context in which they were written and really understand, uh, and then we can add some layer of meaning. Then we can say, well, what does that mean for me? Because sometimes a sheep is just a sheep. The sheep was just doing what it does. It just sort of wanders. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed. He's going looking for some grass, right? But it's something valuable to the owner. So he's willing to risk everything to go find the one. If he actually did that, what do you think happened to the other 99? They're gone. <laughs> They've wandered somewhere else because he's going for the one, which doesn't mean don't go for the one. It just means think about the story and the context in which it was written. So my question is, what is lost for me? And where's the lost and found? So what I mean by that is that the times that we live in, I find myself often that there's something lost. Where is the love in this? Where is the compassion in this? Where is the kindness? How often are we out and about in the world and we watch something and go, yeah, they could have been a little kinder right? Or even myself. I get off a highway, and at the bottom of the ramp, there's somebody sitting there with a cardboard sign, and I, you know, do this. Not necessarily with, physically with my hand, but I don't want to see, right? So, and then I drive on, and I, I, and I sit there, and I look at the light, and I go, okay, let's, come on, change, go green, go green, go green, because I'm, like, hurting, that they're, for whatever reason, they're sitting there, but I'm uncomfortable. And then the light turns green, and I go, what was lost for me in that moment? Compassion, connection, shared humanity? The person sitting there holding the cardboard is no different than me. Circumstances might be a little different, but we have a teaching in unity that says, first one, you read it this morning, one presence and one power, right? Yeah, okay, 12 of us, right? <laughs> and our second principle says, you're it. You are it, which is really just one principle with a nuance, with a little more granular approach. And then we don't have, and then we talk in unity about having five principles. We actually have one or two, and then three practices. Prayer and meditation, what are we thinking and feeling, and put your feet on it. Those are actions. That's me. That's Kelly's definition. Two principles, three actions. But it's a great recipe for working the lost and found. It's a great recipe for working the lost and found. And what I mean by that is that I look at any situation in my life where I am uncomfortable, where I am angry, where I'm frustrated, where I'm disconnected from humanity, when I watch the news and I can't believe, I'm like, ah, where's the comedy channel? Where's the cartoon channel? Right, because I can't, I'm just, ah, there's just too much. I watch Muslim family friends, fam, you know, I, I have Muslim families here that have adopted me, Turkish Muslim families, and I watch them having their relatives not being allowed in. Or they're so terrified, they are not, they can't go home. Or they don't want their face on Facebook. I can't know what that's like, right? What's, and so what's mine to bring? So what's lost in this world? What's lost in my little corner of it? Who has a relationship that's a little bit of a challenge? Okay, I'm not alone. Good. What's lost in the relationship? What's missing? By lost, I mean missing. Is it understanding? Is it compassion? Is it shared reality? What's lost? And am I, what am I willing to do to find it? And to find it actually means to do something. 
actually means to do something. We tend to look at the parables as uh, something that gives us meaning, right? Something to think about. When really what it's calling us is to do something, to be in action. So the lost and found is what's lost, what's missing, what, what is it that I'm needing in this? I have a difficult relationship that I, I, I want us to be closer, but we just, we argue over the same things. You ever have a, an argument with, with the same person? It sounds a little different, but it's really the same one. Day in, day out, week in, month in, month out, year after year. Oftentimes it's with children or spouses. It's the same argument, but we just keep revisiting it. Or if I say whatever I need to say, to get you to get me, if I say it louder and faster, then you'll get it. Then you'll be on the same page with me, right? Then whatever was lost, whatever was missing in the relationship will show up. So, what am I, think about one thing that's a challenge for you. Is it a person? Is it an experience? And when I say a challenge, it could be something that you have a sense of woundedness around. I have, um, I've had a couple friends in the past couple years ghost me. And by ghosting, I mean they just sort of disappear. They don't tell you, they just sort of disappear and you don't see them. And so I have hurt around that. So what's missing for Kelly? What's lost? So what's lost is a sense of generosity, of spirit. Well, guess what the found part is? So I identify what's lost for me. So if that's what's lost, the finding is, so what am I going to do about it? If what I'm noticing that's missing from my day, from my life, from my relationship is generosity of spirit, generosity of heart, then guess who has to put it into the world? Dang it! <laughs> There's a responsibility. Right? There's a responsibility. Who among us would like to have a little more peace? Guess what? When you have a sense that it's lost, when you have a sense that it's missing, guess what your job is? To add it to the mix. Even if you don't feel like it. Even if you know you're right. <laughs> That's the hard part. But I'm right. I shouldn't have to be the one to acquiesce first. I don't want to self-reflect anymore. Please don't make me. We have ownership. If I don't have a sense of, if I personally don't have a sense of belonging with someone in a community, well, guess what? The lost and found is me. It's my job to bring that into the space. And when I say into the space, I mean the relationship, the spiritual community, my community out there, the world, I don't know. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't say, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. Right? Which is much bigger. So you're lost and found. Check the lost and found. That means check what is it that's missing for you in this moment. When you have a struggle, when you have a sense of suffering, a sense of woundedness, you're angry, you're irritated, you're frustrated, you, you have a disconnect. Sometimes I have a huge disconnect from people, and I, feel, and I feel lost, and I feel lonely. Well, guess what I have to do? I'm the lost and found. So I take out that box, right, and rifle through it, and what is it that I'm needing to find? That's what's mine to bring into this world. So I have to stay and be present to me and what's lost. Can you do that with me? Yes. Say with me, I am present. I am present. I am the lost and found. I belong. I matter. I am the Christ in the world. We are the Christ in the world. We create, a world that works. we create a world that works. I don't say that last one one more time with a little joy and a little passion. 
Together, we create a world that works. Amen? Amen. Thank you.